Hey everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Wednesdays with Watson. It is May of 2021, and May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so I am so excited about today's episode as once again, we are bringing you a professional. Today, Dr. Patrice Berry joins the Healing Zone. Because it is Mental Health Awareness Month, I have asked Dr. Berry to join us to discuss co-occurring disorders, things that I like to call friends of PTSD, if you will. So welcome to the show, Dr. Patrice Berry. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. I am a licensed clinical psychologist and so glad to join you for Mental Health Awareness Month. And I think this is such a great topic and excited to add a little bit of information here. Well, you are have been an amazing resource for me. Uh, you and I, as, as a, the last few guests I've actually had on my podcast, uh, our paths crossed on Clubhouse, which is the new audio app. And we'll, we'll put in the show notes where everyone can find both of us on Clubhouse. But thank you for giving me your credentials. I do want to make sure that, we, that, that our listeners understand that what you're going to say here today is for educational and entertainment purposes only. But so I, I want to go into this because like you said, I do believe it is an important topic because my podcast is about PTSD. Everyone who listens knows that I have PTSD. But as I always say, PTSD has cousins, it has friends. I don't happen to have any of these, what we call, what we call co, co-occurring disorders that can, can, that can come into play. And I did wanna ask you before we started talking about a few of those, and this really, everyone answers this question differently from a psychological perspective, that, but is it of your belief in your education and your experience that perhaps trauma comes before some of these co-occurring disorders like bipolar and, and, and OCD and some of the other things, maybe like trauma turns those things on or they were there anyway? So that can be very difficult to figure out, especially depending on when somebody's negative life event happened. So depending on when it happened, that can really determine what happens. Uh, I do the biopsychosocial spiritual model where there might have been some biology plus some life events plus. So there, there might have been some things that kind of go, go along. Um, individuals that have wiring for anxiety can sometimes have a higher chance of of meeting criteria for PTSD because not everybody that goes through a negative life event will meet criteria for PTSD. Like, so things can appear in different ways for for different people. Um, When I did psychological evaluations and somebody did have a history of trauma, I used to like to figure out, because in young kids, it can resemble ADHD symptoms, but it's actually trauma. So in, in young kids, it's a very dysregulated child. It can look a certain way and if they had a history of trauma, because I would do evaluations for the Department of Social Services, I would want them to address those symptoms before we gave other diagnoses, um, because sometimes it doesn't always present the same way for everybody. Um, And so that's where somebody would talk with their practitioner about how it maybe came about, because really it's how are you functioning before and then how are you functioning now? And sometimes some of the things that people pick up, it helped them survive that event. And now that they are safe, the problem is that we're still doing a lot of those behaviors, even though we're safe now. And so I'm very careful when I'm working with people to not take away some things too fast because those may be their coping and their survival things. And so I want to add skills. I want to add things before we start stripping some of those defenses away. Wow. That's a great answer to the question. Cause like you said, it's complicated, which came first, the chicken or the egg. And it, and it does really heavily depend on when the trauma came, right? Because we know that basically the brain has done it. The emotional part anyway, has done its thing by the, by the age of six, right? So if some of that trauma happened earlier, and I think they're even thinking younger now um, where the age, but that was, that was a question I threw out at you that I didn't prepare you for. I apologize. It's just something I'm super curious about because in my, in my interactions with people who listen to the podcast, there are a lot of these co-occurring 
disorders. And because it is Mental Health Awareness Month and because you've got all the letters behind your name, I wanted to talk about a few of them. And so let's jump right into that. Let's start with bipolar disorder. Could you help us understand bipolar disorder and and in whatever way you want? Because I, I want listeners, my listeners have learned so much about PTSD just by basically breaking it down to the streets. And so let's talk about bipolar disorder first as we are honoring Mental Health Awareness Month. The most important thing about bipolar disorder is that somebody has experienced either manic episodes or hypomanic. And how I typically explain that is they are very, very, very high highs and or um, and that's where they would work out with their practitioner um, because sometimes Um, People have things, they might have an emotional dysregulation that is triggered by certain events. It's triggered by rejection. It's triggered by feelings of abandonment. If it's triggered by certain things, um, because I have a lot of people that bring me teenagers and they say they have mood swings and they're wondering if their teenager has bipolar disorder, but bipolar disorder is more than just a mood swing. It's really, really high highs and um, and then some some low lows and really working with somebody to really figure out is it a true manic episode or is this more of a emotional dysregulation that's within a person's personality which would link more towards a borderline personality disorder or some, well, some of those, that's, those that's a that's a perfect segue so let's talk about borderline personality disorder because that is one that i do see a lot of with ptsd so people will come to me and say i have ptsd and borderline personality disorder so that's a beautiful segue into into borderline personality disorder And I have so much honor and respect for people. So often people can view people that have, so some of the, some of the DSM symptoms for somebody that has borderline personality disorder, they might frequently make threats or there might be some um, things that they do to, that are not safe and they um, may exhibit some very extreme behaviors. And, but really when I look back at their story, they often had early childhood trauma and never really got a chance to learn how to regulate their emotions. So regulating our emotions is something that we have to be taught. And when our brain is in survival mode, we don't get to learn those things. Dr. Marsha Linehan developed dialectical behavior therapy, and I am trained, I do skills training, I don't do the full program, but within teaching people skills, it's validating your experience is real, and we have to challenge the feeling sometimes. So just because I'm feeling angry doesn't mean I get to curse out my partner and throw things all over. And so I can validate the emotion without exhibiting the, the behavior. And it's, and it's really giving them validation because often the people that I've met, they have been invalidated. They often haven't been believed or when they had smaller emotions, they didn't get the, the attention and the support that they needed. And so their emotions had to be big and they kind of had to exhibit these very big behaviors. And often I've seen that sometimes that's how people notice that something wasn't okay. And that might've been how they got safe. And so that's why I do validate these things because there's a lot of stigma associated with a lot of these disorders. And I don't like, sometimes it's portrayed very negatively in the media and it's portrayed in a way that isn't true to the people that actually sit across from me in my office. And so they, they hear this big diagnosis and then they're, they're thinking, um, they're, they, 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 um, they begin to struggle. And so it's often somebody that doesn't know how to get their needs met the right way because they're often described as manipulative. And the way I look at manipulation is that a person, if they can get their need met the right way. So if I can ask you, may I have some water? and you give it to me, then that's how I'll ask for it. But if I think I have to say, "Uh, I haven't had water in a week, like if I feel like I have to make it big in order to get that need met, then I'm just getting needs met. And so I teach them how to get their needs met in more appropriate ways. 
Wow. And we've, we've, we've talked about that from a PTSD standpoint. Um, I called them attention seeking behaviors and I even, I even have talked about my own attention seeking behaviors on my own podcast. And so, wow, what a beautiful description of, of, of borderline personality disorder. These, the, the next, the, the next one is social anxiety. That is one that um, is probably more common. And I, and I definitely hear that a lot with PTSD. And, and, and as we know, if you have PTSD at some point, your safety has been violated. And so I bet you and your practice see social anxiety and PTSD together a lot, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm making a supposition that's not true, but what about social anxiety disorder as we continue to highlight co-occurring disorders during Mental Health Awareness Month? With social anxiety, it's often when, go, when going in public, not feeling like you belong, feeling out of place, feeling like other people are speaking negatively about you. And that's where I often like to check with the person to see if that is really happening. Mm. Because for some people, they, they are getting negative stares. They are, people are talking about them. And so that would, that would be a very valid experience if they were feeling that way. But social anxiety, it sometimes, um, sometimes it gets so bad that people struggle to, to leave the house. And um, it's really feeling out of place out, out, out in public. Um, gotcha. That's, that's how I often describe it. It's a good description, actually, because I, I, I walk closely with someone with social anxiety disorder. It's a beautiful description. Um, how about obsessive compulsive disorder? All right. And so that is more than just washing your hands a lot. And Thank I you. feel like <laughs> it is. And um, very smart people, very successful people typically have some OCD traits. They typically have some, some traits and features. Um, where they like things a certain way, but somebody that has um, OCD, they typically, it is an, an irrational fear where I think something bad is going to happen if I don't check the clock 20 times before I leave the house. And it's causing a significant problem. So it's not, so every now and then when I leave the house, I think I might have left the garage door up, <laughs> but it, it, it would be ch having to check five times. Mine's my, knowing mine is that, my flat iron. My flat iron. Did I unplug my flat iron? Yeah. That is the flat iron on. That is that is so common. And so being able to um, but but for somebody that has obsessive compulsive disorder, it is very extreme. Like there are a lot of rituals. There may be um, a certain, um, they may count certain things. Um, uh, often when I'm working with teens that have recently been, been diagnosed and I ask them, so are there certain numbers that have meaning for you? They look at me like, oh, are you some, are you in my head? <laughs> like, <laughs> how did you know that I'm, that I have to count things in, in certain groups or, um, and each of these things, because we are giving very general yes. explanations yes. and uh, there is the diagnostic and statistical manual five. Um, I use the, the DSM five and they say clearly how, how things should be. Um, it is very frustrating and I want to mention that that one person could go see one person and get a certain diagnosis and then they may go to somebody else and get a very different diagnosis. And so I think it's really important that people meet with somebody who is trauma informed. So if the first time I, I, I meet with somebody, if this is the first First time that they have disclosed what's happened to them in their past, I often will be very, I might only give them, uh, if they meet criteria for PTSD, I might just do that and then see what happens as we begin to treat the, the trauma. Because because um, I've, I've worked with six-year-olds that come in that have, and they're in foster care and they have six different diagnoses. And I'm like, how? No, <laughs> no, like this can, we can narrow this down. We can, we can put this together. And so making sure to get a really good trauma-informed eval. Um, if you're looking for a therapist, if you're looking for somebody that, that does an evaluation, asking them, what is your approach? with somebody that has a history of, of trauma. Because my approach was to just ask questions in a very gentle way. I let people own their story because the evaluation process, the, ther the, the therapy process can be very triggering and often feeling out of control is something that people have a lot. And so I try to give my, my clients as much control as possible um, just so when they come in, if, if they wanna say, I don't wanna go there today, we, we can talk about that and we can figure out because maybe they just had a bunch of stuff at work. They have a bunch of stuff at home and just today is not the day. 
because we can't control what happens, what, what already happened. I can't change that, but I can give them, I can empower them to talk in a way that is supportive and encouraging to them. Wow. I, I kind of feel like I'm in a therapy session right now, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know what? You just brought up something beautiful too, because this podcast is what we call the three C's. And I talk about this is, I, I have three C's that I feel like has helped me in my, in, in my, and by the way, the, the DSM-5 needs to add complex post-traumatic stress disorder to it. I'm just saying that's free for everybody out there. But, um, but you just mentioned one of them, trauma-informed counseling, which is clearly important to you. And yes. Dr. Barry, I spent, you know, my first trauma was at three years old. And I, you can imagine the amount of counselors that I saw through the social workers and stuff like that. But it wasn't until I was 35 years old and a week before I ended up in a psych ward that I landed at a trauma-informed counselor. And so I think, thank you for highlighting that. Now, here's where I'd love to just get a, pick, your, pick a little bit of your, your, more of your brain as my friend and then as my sister in Christ, because we do share um, the same faith, but many, many people on this podcast don't. Now, there are two other C's that we talk about. One is church, but one is community. I will pick your brain from a psychologist standpoint first on that community one. Can you help people understand uh, those who, who may not go to church and whatever church looks like to them, and it all looks different to us right now, or, or who may not even believe in, 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 a, in a higher power? Why is community so powerful in the healing of any of these things that we've talked about? And then maybe more specifically to PTSD, since that's what the podcast is about. Within trauma-informed care, we talk about that the hurt happened in relationship and then the healing happens within relationship. That relationships, that, that new safe relationships. So we want to have safe community. Because sometimes, so if, if, if I've been through a lot and I don't know what safety is, sometimes safety can feel unsafe. Oh, wow. Where if, if somebody is being positive, nobody is speaking down to me, nobody is telling me what I'm not, but that's what I'm used to that safety can sometimes feel unsafe where I'm thinking, what do they want? What are they really after? Are they really supporting me? Or, or like somebody can really get, get, so safety can sometimes not feel safe. And so I really try to help my, my clients find safe communities. And that might be one or two people. Community does not have to be a whole large group of people. And even within church, I would like to say that sometimes some people have hurt that happens within church and yep. it can be difficult to return there. I know you, you, you talk about that all the time. And so um, I've, I've had people that have had anger at God and in the midst of their pain, they could not return to church, but they could go to a small, a, a small support group with people that, that went through something similar. And along the way, some people come back to their faith, some people don't. They but, find their way um, back. Because cause when, when, when we're hurting, sometimes we don't want to hear certain things or we just, sometimes we, we shut ourselves down to God or to, 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 to different things in our lives. We shut ourselves down that there's things that we can't understand. And if there's anything that's more difficult to understand, sometimes it is God, right? Um, many of my guests I've asked, where was God when X, right? And the answers that I've gotten have been amazing because like you said, in community, somehow they found their way back to their faith. My pastor calls that community your 2 a.m. friends. Who can you pick up the phone at 2 a.m. and call? And so you also just beautifully segued into my, my last question for you. I, this podcast is called PTSD, Jesus, and You. My first, podcast, my first season was called PTSD, Jesus, and Me, where I told my story. But I believe that Jesus is the star of my story. In fact, I not only believe it, I declare that Jesus is the star of my story. But not everyone listening to my podcast, not everyone that, that, will, that will listen, that you're, you're streaming this live on TikTok right now, believes in the star of the story, believes in Jesus. But I would love it, I'd love that to, to close with this closing question is regardless of whether you believe in God, whether you're trying to find your way back to God or something, why is it important for our healing to believe in something bigger than us? And really, I think the organization that does this the best is with substance abuse. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, 12-step uh, programs. 
one of the steps is to believe in something bigger than me. And that bigger thing could be, it could be family. It could be anything. Just, just believing in something bigger than you because we don't always have faith in, in ourselves. Sometimes the self is what is broken. And sometimes people doing it for themselves, it's just, that's not how we were created. I believe that we were made for, for, for community. We were made to connect. I am a psychologist that happens to be a Christian. I don't operate within a Christian setting. Many of the people that I work with have come from different faiths or don't identify with a specific religion. And because as a therapist, it's my job to help them connect with themselves and not necessary and not to believe whatever whatever I believe. And because um, I think one of the biggest things that sometimes Christians miss is the love of God and truly showing people love and um, that that being the greatest commandment, being able to, to, to show love. And, um, and I really do think that um, just, it just gives some, some hope. So often what can happen is when bad things happen is we can lose our faith. We can lose our hope in humanity, in life, in a lot of different things. And so being able to, to have some hope and some belief in something can be, can be just reassuring, even if it's, even if it's a belief in Monday night football that I'm gonna, like it can be anything, but that can help set somebody up when they do get discouraged, when they do mess up, because we're, we're imperfect. We, we, we will make mistakes and people are, are imperfect. And so that's where I do like sometimes when people, when they're putting their faith in something that is just a little bit bigger than them, that, that, that can be really helpful. I love that example because one of the ways I make it through my days, especially over the last we, we've been saying year, so now we're going to say almost a year and a half of the global pandemic is having something on the calendar. I missed I, I, something to be to hope for, to your point. Well, Dr. Barry, thank you so much for being here today. I want my listeners to know, though, where they can find you. You have got the most hilarious, which I'm assuming is a copy of your TikTok account, um, IG Reels. Can you please tell my listeners your, where they can find you? Because they are just so, so awesome. So can tell us where, where my listeners, where they can find you. Thank you so much. So I am on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Dr. Patrice Berry. So that's at Dr. Dr. Patrice, P-A-T-R-I-C-E-B-E-R-R-Y. Um, that is that that is my handle across across platforms. Um, I also do some um, some longer content on on YouTube. Um, sometimes I upload some videos to into IGTV, um, but um, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, those are are my main platforms. And guys, I can't tell you enough uh, how hilarious they are. She takes she takes mental health and she makes it relatable. She makes it funny. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much for coming on today. Is there anything else that you would like to add? So my, my closing thing will be that it's okay to not be okay. And when I'm not okay, I just need some help and support. And sometimes that help and support, it's enough for me to talk to my friends. Sometimes it's enough for me to reach out to family. And when those things are not enough and I need to reach out and connect with, with a professional. So the, the most important thing about therapy is having a good relationship with your therapist. I am honest with the fact that I, when I, my first therapist was not the right fit for me. It did not go well. I think I only went for two or three sessions and I did the bad thing. I ghosted her. Like I just, I just stopped scheduling appointments, never, never heard from her again, but it, it took, it took some time for me to try again. And I found the right fit. I found the right person. And what I did was I looked for somebody that specialized in what I needed to work on because working with somebody that, that, um, that is going to see things in a way that is supportive and encouraging to you. Um, I see a lot. For some people, cognitive behavior therapy, where we're challenging irrational thoughts, that can be really helpful for them. But sometimes people with PTSD, um, CBT can feel really invalidating. And so that it might be the wrong fit. It might be the wrong person and to try again. And in my Instagram bio, I have a link to resources where people, if you're looking for a therapist, um, somebody, um, uh, one of my friends on TikTok, 
my my destination created this amazing website where people are able to to find a therapist and so if you're looking for somebody especially this month and sometimes the right person you might have to wait a month or two i'm just being honest right <laughs> so. if they're if they're taking new patients that might be a, a, a just think about it for a second right it can especially it can, right now Yes. And so, um, uh, to, to be able, cause sometimes the right person might, might be booked for a little while and you, and, and you might right. have to, wait. um, and so just, just being able to reach out for support if, if you need it and that, well, that that's okay. And what we'll do is I'll get that link from you. So, and, and I'm also going to link your Instagram and your TikTok, all of your social medias and the show notes guys. So while you're there in your app, go ahead and click on, uh, on that. So as we end today, I would just like to thank you for your time. As I always say, there is something, time is uh, something that we're not making more of. So thank you. I would love for you to connect while you're in your app, just like I just said for Dr. Barry, follow us on social media platforms. Um, and until then, you know what I'm gonna say, let the healing continue. Thank you, Dr. Barry, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. So let my life glorify you and teach me to walk beside